excited to see you all here today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, did I just fade out when I came back? No, I, I think I may need a battery. We'll see. Um, anyway, man, we're, we're glad you're here uh, with all the distractions going on. All those things that can occupy our mind, our thoughts, our energy, and I am subject to all of those, so pray for me. Um, I was preparing earlier, uh, last week, Pastor Travis preached on Fight Well. Cammie shared on Celebrate Sunday about how Paul told Timothy to fight the good fight. And so I thought I would build on that, and I was in the uh, First Timothy, fight the good fight context, and looking at that, you know, you, you don't think about that, you don't think about fight the good fight, that fight and fight is the same word, right? Fight and fight is the same word, but it has two meanings, and it goes back to, it, it was a, <laughs> um, I'm not going to preach this, but I'm going to share it with you anyway. It goes back to it was a Paul wrote in Greek, and it was one of the uh, simpler Greek forms. And that phrase, fight the good fight, was basically, it was a word that was used when they would protect the homeland. You know, it wasn't about going out and, and going to war. It was about getting, the military would fight the good fight to protect what is ours. And how that would apply to the church and that, that we hold the line, that we, we keep things in agreement with the Word of God. But I just couldn't get there with that. I, I was just like, oh man, because I'm a lectionary guy. I'm a lectionary guy because if I go picking Scripture, I go cherry picking Scripture. I pick the one I want. So I go to the lectionary and the uh, New Testament, New Testament they're killing John the Baptist again. Man, we have killed that dude to death. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we have killed John the Baptist many times. Uh, it seems like every time I preach, it's kill John the Baptist. And so I thought, man, I can't do that. I just, I, I can't kill John again. So I went to the epistles. Well, it's Ephesians 1. We did Ephesians in June. And so, man, I can't, I can't do Ephesians again. Man, we just did Ephesians. And so I, I tell you what, I'll go to the Old Testament. And so I, I get to the Old Well, the Old Testament is Samuel bringing the Ark of the Covenant back. Where Ohio, 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 what's that guy's name? The old boy that touched the Ark and got died. I think it was Uzziah. Anyway, yeah, it's one of those dudes, reached out, touched the Ark, God killed him. I'm like, Nah, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Looked at the Psalms. You know, the Psalms are fun, but the Psalms are very much that song that was playing when you met your girlfriend. You fell in love. You know that song? That pretty song? When heaven meets earth like a sloppy wet kiss? <laughs> that song. I knew you'd enjoy that. I said that just for Brad. Hello, Facebook. <laughs> you know that song, and it's, and it's playing in the background, and it's, every time that song comes up, you go, oh, I love her. Oh. Yeah, guys that do that, you're not my friend. <laughs> just, <laughs> just for the record, we, we're not friends anymore. Uh, and you play it, you know, and you play it when, on, on, on your anniversary. And that. But then, but just how, is that really life-changing? I looked at what the lectionary offered in the prophets, and it was Amos chapter 7. Let me read a portion. We'll go back and fill in the gap. <laughs> Amos chapter 7, beginning in verse 7. And this is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had built, been built true plumb with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, What do you see, Amos? 
A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I'm setting a plumb line among the people of Israel. I will spare them no longer. I'm setting a plumb line against the people of Israel. I will spare them no longer. Why is this important? Why is this plumb line? We, we chances are, many of us, some of us, how many guys know what a plumb line is? And what do we call it? Plumb bob, right? It's a plumb bob. And you can drop it, and you know exactly what straight down is. And you can put it up against the wall, and you can tell if that wall is straight, if that wall is plumb. Why is that important? Because back then, everything was made out of rock. I don't know if you know this, but weight transfers down. If you are straight up and down, and you stack straight up and down, that wall will stand forever. All weight is transferred down. You put the slightest lean on it, that wall is going to fall. Not only will it be destroyed, but it will hurt those people around it. That's why it's important, especially dealing with uh, stone structures, that it be plumb, that it be level in today's vernacular. This is important to you and I because our spiritual walk must be plumb as well. You see, our spiritual walk should be in full agreement in line with the Word of God. It's not real complicated. If God says it, then we should do it. If He says don't do it, you shouldn't. It's kind of a rule. Right? Amen or oh me? Amen. Uh, Facebook, type in amen so I know somebody's listening. <laughs> We should be in full agreement. Now I'm going to ask you a question. I asked first service, and I got a little offended, but I got over it. Okay. Come on. They turned me off. Ready? Come on. Are you studying the Word of God? Where? And if you say I'm studying everywhere, you're telling me you're studying nowhere. Are you studying the Word of God? It'd be like, for me not to study the Word of God, would be like for me to take our favorite song and for me to run it in the background and never again tell my wife I love her. It's running in the background. Didn't you, didn't you hear the, our song, sweetheart? Our song is running in the background. And for me to never say, hey, baby, I love you. For me to never make time for her, for me to never invest another moment in her because I got the song running in the background. And that's what you and I do. You notice I said you and I. It's me and ye that makes we who get caught up in the business of the world and we devote one hour a week and only 30 minutes of that to the Word of God. And we will never grace the pages of God's Word again. You know we're involved. Brad and I are involved in a Bible study every, every morning at 6.30. We go through the whole Word. That's not Bible study. That's Bible reading. And that's all fine and well. But if you're not in 1 Timothy, digging out, fight the good fight to find out what Paul is saying to Timothy, you're missing it, friends. You're not telling him you love him. You're saying you're of no value to me. I'm going to play our love song in the background. That just ought to be enough for you. And that's as deep as you've got. Let's go. I want to go back up here. Go back to verse 1. And I'm going to lose it. Um, is somebody here that knows how to get in the office? <laughs> Hearing none. I know, that's what I'm afraid of. <laughs> With a refuge. We can get in the office. Can whoever in the sound room, will you go will you go ask Brian to bring me Travis's uh, mic? Because my battery's going out. Okay. Back to one. Back, uh, there's a code, guys. It's a secret code. Verse one. Chapter seven, verse one. This is what the sovereign Lord showed me. He was 
preparing swarms of locusts after the king's share had been harvested. And just as the second crop was coming up, when they had stripped the land clean, I cried out, Sovereign Lord, forgive. How can Jacob survive? He is so small. Verse 3, so the Lord relented. I want you to hear that. I cried out. And can you make sure that channel 4 is on as well? He says, I cried out. Here's what you need to hear. This was a kingdom, a society of people that was about to be devastated. About to be, now turn me off. about to be destroyed. I don't know. Maybe we can relate to that right now. I don't know. I'm not going to talk about it. I don't know. A nation about to be destroyed by natural disaster. God told him. God gave him a vision. And he said, oh God, please don't. What? <laughs> That's not enough. Dude, you gotta pray right. You gotta pray long. You gotta pray loud. Oh God, please don't. And the word says that God relented. Now you may have one of the new translations that says that God repented. What it means is God said, okay, because you prayed, I won't do it. I don't know. Maybe if one of us, or two, I don't know, if two would agree upon and would say, Oh God, we are your people, called by your name. God, we humbly pray, seeking your face. Would you heal our land? Would you, God, heal our church? Would you heal? to continuing to walk in this unplumbed, unlevel, unsanctified, unsettled state of life that's not in agreement with God's word. Let's move down, verse 4. Verse, back to verse 3. This will not happen, the Lord said. And this is what the Sovereign Lord showed me in his second vision. The Sovereign Lord was calling... For judgment by fire, it dried up the great deep and devoured the land. Then I cried out, Sovereign Lord, I beg you, stop. How can Jacob survive? He is so small. Once again, one man called upon God and a nation was rescued. A nation was rescued. If you don't believe that our nation is under God's judgment, you're not paying attention and you're not studying your word. Because if you look at the word of God and you see, and he says when people go under, get under judgment, he turns them over to a reprobate mind. And if you don't see the reprobate mind that has overtaken our nation, then you aren't paying attention. And that means that we are under God's judgment. It says for the destruction of their flesh that their soul might be saved. Oh God, that we don't have to be destroyed. Amen. If my people, that's you and I, called by my name would humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I would hear from heaven. Then I would answer their prayer. Then I would heal their land. But it requires that you and I, me, you, us, we, my people, stop and say, Oh God, heal our land. Oh, God, don't let us fall down this path. Oh, God, protect us from ourselves. Because we are a wicked people. Oh, Brother Ellen, I'm not wicked. Then the Bible's a liar. Because the Bible says you're wicked. Just telling you what the Bible said. The Bible says the heart of man is wicked above all things. 
You know, we're all going to get to heaven and we're going to say, the devil made me do it, and the devil go, I didn't do that. You did that on your own. I didn't even have anything to do with that. Jesus, you know I was up here with you when they did that. And Jesus goes, you're right. And he was up here. He is accusing you of doing it, but he was up here. If my people, recognizing who we are, right? Recognizing who we are. Let's move back down to verse 7 again. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by the wall that had been built true to plumb. Hear that, true to plumb, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see? A plumb line, I said. Then the Lord said, look, I'm setting a plumb line against my people Israel. Who, who did Amos rescue? Oh, Jacob. What's the difference in Jacob and Israel? Think about it. An encounter with God. An encounter with God. You remember when Jacob, the supplanter, right? He wrestled, God all night. wrestled with God. And God said, I ain't going to let you go. Touched his hip. Changed his name. Changed his name. You see, that's... That's the encounter with God when you and I, when you and I came to a place of grace and we saw Jesus, man, we saw him as he was. We looked upon his face and he changed us forever. Amen. He changed the nature of our spirit. Amen. Man, that old man, these, I don't know about you. I do not know about you. And you're lucky because if I did, I would tell. Just because it would be fun. But I know about me. Amen? You know about you, I know about me. If there was, a, like they said, I tell you what we're going to do. We now have the ability that we're going to set you in a chair and the whole congregation is going to watch every event of your life since you were born. Yeah. How many want to stay for that show? Right? Now, here's the good news. I'm in the W's, and we're going last. And I know y'all are all going to be gone before they get to me. How horrible would that be? But I know me, right? And that guy, that guy wrestled with God. And God touched him, and God changed him. See, that's the cool thing about this. That is what Israel, Israel is Jacob changed by the presence of God. So when we get into that and we start talking about salvation by faith, oh, okay, so you are not plumb. Are you still saved? I believe you are. Are you still a child of God? I don't think you lose that. I don't think that ceases to be. There's not a saved by grace through faith as long as you act right. I, I didn't see that in there. Nope. As long as you act right. Because I, on occasion, have a bad day. I used to always, when I was in that, when that tradition that you fall from grace, I used to always pray, God, come on a good day. Just come on a good day. I just, shoo. Or come early. Come early in the day. That's better. On a, early in a good day. Let's go there. I will not pass by. Israel. He goes on in chapter 5, or verse 5. The high places of Isaac will be destroyed. The sanctuaries of Israel will be ruined. My sword I will raise against the house of Jeroboam, then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent a message to Jeroboam, king of Israel. Amos is raising a conspiracy against you in the very heart of Israel. The land cannot bear all these words. Let me just stop right there. Do y'all know what Bethel is? Do you know what Bethel, the city of Bethel? Just, and you shouldn't, I, hope, I want you to know this. I don't, I don't care if you do or not. I want you to know this. After Solomon, the this, this nation of Israel broke in two. You have the ten tribes of the north. Most often we see them as Israel or Ephraim. Ephraim being the largest gathering of the sons of Joseph. Those are the ten tribes of the north. In the south you have Judah or Judea. And that is Judah and Benjamin. 
And so you have the two nations who are actually battling against each other. There is often a good king in Judah. I say often, it's kind of a 50-50 thing. You have a good king, you have a bad king. You may have two good kings and three bad kings. But there's kind of a rotating circle. Good king, bad king. The northern kingdom never had a good king. To this point, that Jeroboam was probably the worst of their kings. He was as bad as they got. They worshipped idols. They did all kinds of horrible things, including sacrificing their first child to Molech. Now, I'm, I'm just going to put it in context. The reason they did that was so that their other children would prosper. In the same way that we tell young ladies, you should go ahead and abort this one because you don't want to burden the rest of your life. That way you can raise your other children and not be burdened by this one. And if you think that we're not guilty of the same sin of sacrificing children to Moloch, you're not paying attention. Absolutely. Because we are. Yeah. And we are. And I, I, that's, not a, that's not a ye. That's a we. Because we are the nation. We are the people. Yeah. If you go back to the first curse, it said that the, the king had already gathered his grain. It was the second, cur the second harvest that was going to be cursed. Who did the second harvest go to? It went to the people. The people are the ones that are going to suffer. Those in leadership, those in authority over us, they're not the ones that are going to suffer if God brings this nation down. It's the people, and it's going to be the people of God who did nothing. They will suffer. That's why you and I, we must come to a place that we choose each and every day to pray and to cry out to God. Bethel was one of the two capitals of the northern kingdom. Bethel was one of the two places where they built the second temple. And they, they actually built two temples in the northern kingdom. And to make it worse, they set up a golden calf in the temple. So you had the people of Israel going to a temple, offering sacrifice to a golden calf. We hadn't seen that before, have we? And the king did it because he didn't want them to go down because they had a nation that was split. We hadn't experienced that either. To keep them from going down to the southern ki uh, kingdom and worshiping in that temple, he built two in the northern temple, put golden calves in it so that they could come and worship and offer sacrifice there. The, uh, wait a minute. I'm working it out. I'll get by it. I just, I want to give, hello Facebook. Let's move on. Verse 11. For this is what Amos is saying. Jeroboam will die by the sword. Israel will surely go into ex exile away from their native land. I'm going to tell you this, that is not what he said. And the one thing you need to know is that the enemy of God will always twist or lie about the Word of God. To this point, if we as leadership open up the Word of God, we stay out of the Old Testament a lot of times. Sometimes because it doesn't apply in the same way. Other times because it is aggressive and it's offensive. And we say things that are aggressive and offensive, which is, thou shalt not then we're going to hurt somebody's feelings. And they're going to get mad and leave, or worse, they'll get mad and stay. And then they'll start this. Well, you know, you know what he said to me? You won't believe what he said to me. Who, okay, was I wrong? Did I tell you the truth? Did it hurt your feelings? Be a grown-up. Come on, guys. Man, if the Word says, Thou shalt not steal, and you're stealing... You can't be mad at me. Be mad at God. God, how am I going to pay the bills if I don't steal? I don't know. Get a job? Thoughts? We can work towards that end. But for us to hear and do the Word of God, the enemy will come along and say, well, that's not what it means. And I'm telling you, that's what it means. 
That's what it means. Read the Word of God. If it offends you, pray about it. If you're still offended, get better. If you misread it, God by His Holy Spirit would go, <laughs> you thought what? Let me show you what that really means. And it'll become so clear to you. And you can go to somebody and say, hey, read this. What does it say to you? And they'll repeat what God has told you. And you will know that you misunderstood and the enemy was trying to make you mad. Or he's trying to get you to change. The Word of God does that. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Get out, you seer. Go back to the land of Judah. Earn your bread there and do your prophesying there. Don't prophesy anymore to Bethel because this is the king's sanctuary and the temple of the kingdom. And Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. That's a wild fig tree. He was a wild fig tree harvester. That's the job I want when I grow up. But the Lord took me from the tending of the flocks and said to me, Go prophesy out of the people of Israel. Now then, hear the word of the Lord. He said to me, Go and prophesy to the temple of Jesus, or the temple, temple of Israel, or the people of Israel. What is he saying to you and I? He is saying to you, I remember, that he was in the southern kingdom where the good king was. He had a farm. He harvested wild pig, uh, figs. His life was pretty simple. He didn't have a whole lot to... You could say he was living well. And God said, I need you to get out of your comfort zone and go there. You and I can become so complacent in our faith that we are no longer useful for the kingdom. We've become so complacent in our faith that we're no longer useful. We don't read the Word of God. I've read it a hundred times. Read it one more. You know what I found out about the Word of God? You may not know this. Everybody know what the Mandela effect is? You know what the Mandela effect is, right? They've been changing the Bible. Because I read it last year, that stuff wasn't in there. Every year, me and Brad will be reading through it, and I'll be like, that wasn't there last year. We read this, that wasn't. No, the Word is alive. As God continues to reveal Himself to us, day after day, moment after moment, chapter after chapter, verse after verse, and we read it, and we're like, no, how did we miss this before? And you go back, and you look in your Bible, and you, you highlight, I didn't highlight that. How come I didn't highlight that? Or sometimes you did highlight it, and you wrote notes, and your notes were wrong, because suddenly you were more aware of who God was and what God was doing amongst His people. He said to Amos, he said, Amos, I know you got it good down there, but I need you to go up here. Sometimes that looks like me and you going to, uh, I don't know, to be kind to our enemy, to our irritant, to our opposite, to that person who ain't like us and don't like us. But God says, you know what? I need you to come out of there because I need them to see what the face of Jesus looks like. So I need you to be that face. Would you go do that? And I say, oh, God, I'm so comfortable down here. Yeah, I know you are. And you look good sitting there. But I need you to get up and go talk to my brother. Go talk to your brother. Go talk to my son who has separated himself from me. And the only thing that's going to save him is if somebody like you loves him where he's at. And we step out of our comfort zone and we go into that place. I want to read this last part and we're going to wrap up because we're out of time. You say, I'm in verse 16, do not prophesy against Israel and stop preaching against the house of Isaac because this is what the Lord says, your wife will become a prostitute in the city. Your sons and daughters will fall by the sword. Your land will be measured and divided. You yourself will die in a pagan country. Israel will certainly go into exile away from their native land. 
as I read through this text and preparing for this morning, the thing that captured me, this all came true for Israel, for Ephraim, about 40 years later. I don't want this to come true for my country. I want my grandchildren to know the country that I grew up in. Do you remember that country when we knew it was time to go home because the streetlights came on? A country that was so safe that our parents had to be reminded that they had children. Y'all remember that, don't you? It's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? Nationwide, baby, nationwide. Parents had to be reminded they had kids because that's how free we were. That's how free we were as we celebrated. And what was different back then is that we were a people who worshipped God. We were a people who studied His Word. I remember my grandfather, his Bible was tattered. I'm sure it was thrown away by my uncle. I don't know that, but I'm sure it was. But it was absolutely worn out because he had searched the Word of God. This Bible for 50 years. As he went, and the pages were coming out, and he had to tuck them back in, and he had to tape them, and he, and he, never, he would never write in his Bible. He would never desecrate. He would never add jot or tittle to his word, but he would study it, and he would read it every night, every night, without fail, no matter what. Every night he was invested in the Word of God. That's who our nation was some time back. Got a cough. <coughs> I want that for my grandkids. I want my grandkids to say, Papa, you won't believe. You won't believe how good it is. And I look at our nation today and I don't see that, my friends. I see a nation turned over to a reprobate mind for the destruction of its flesh that its soul might be saved. And I want to cry out and say, Oh God, oh God, we are your people. God, we're your people. Don't do this. Save us. Heal our land. Bring us back into right standing with you, into righteousness. We have a whole lot, of, and I'm out of time, and I'm, and I'm going to quit, I promise. we got a whole lot of social gospel going on, and it's this stuff right here, right? It's, it's, it's feed the poor and clothe the naked and, and, and all that stuff, and I'm not against that. I'm not opposed to that at all, but this right here, this right here doesn't put nobody in right standing with God. It doesn't make anybody plumb doesn't square anybody up. It does not create righteousness. Righteousness only comes when we become invested in a one-on-one -on -one with a living, loving God. Amen. That's when righteousness comes. And that's the only way. If I come to my brother and I say, I'll tell you what, man, I'm just going to give you food forever. And he says, you're the best. And I go, yay, I'm the best. That ain't getting him to heaven. That ain't getting him in relationship with God. Except that I say, but I got spiritual food that you know not of. I mean, I'm going to help you eat. That's a good thing. But I got spiritual food I need to share with you. I need to show you my God. Amen. Because he set a plumb line in the church. And he said, I've got to measure you. I've got to measure you. I don't like it. That's me. I don't like it. But I know if I don't be measured... I will be broken. Brothers and sisters, I ask you today, just as resolution, as commitment, as devotion, would you begin to invest in the Word of God? Just start reading it. I don't care where. What if I start in Leviticus? Start in Leviticus. God's big enough to show you truth there. He's big enough. God will fool you. He'll put something out there you didn't expect. And it'll change your life forever. Start reading your word. 15 minutes a day, 5 minutes a day, 3 minutes a day. Just whatever it is a day. And along with that, start praying. Heal our land. One man changed the nation. What if, I don't know, the 240 that were here today 
would start crying out to God and say, Oh God, oh God, heal our land. Don't let this curse come upon us. Heal our land. We're your people, God. Heal our land. Turn your face to us, God. Heal our land. It's got to start somewhere. <laughs> I was thinking about Amos. He was an old farm and fig picker. Man, that's hard to say. That's, I wouldn't suggest you say that often or fast. <laughs> How much... Y'all ran, ran that through the algorithm, didn't you? <laughs> how, much, how much more like the refuge could he be? How much more like a refugee could he be? Man, we're going to pray together, and I'm going to pray for you. <laughs> but I just once again want to encourage you. Pray. Study God's Word. Be changed by it. Stand together. This morning, who do we pray to? Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, Lord, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Father God, we love you. And Master, we stand together as your people, called by your name. And Master, with one voice we ask, hear our prayers, heal our land, God, we know that we are sinners before you. We know that we are, except for Jesus, Master, we are lost completely. So we put our trust in him. We put our hope in him. And we ask in the name of Jesus, your son, would you heal our land? We thank you for it. Continue to guide and guard this, your people. Cause your face, God, to turn upon them. Be gracious to each of them and all of them. Again, let your countenance be ours. The peace of God that passes understanding be established in each life, in each home, in this body. It's in his name. Amen.